that was really a tough time in my life. You know, we need to stop making excuses in life and we need to own them. What's the one thing you can do as a leader to really gain the respect of your subordinates? All this has come together for a reason almost, man. This is the Fire Dog Podcast. The views and opinions presented on today's episode are those of the speaker and do not necessarily represent the views of the Department of Defense or the United States Air Force. Welcome, my name is Matt Wilson. I'm joined with my co-host, Ben Perry, and thank you for listening to another episode of the podcast. Our guest today is joining us from Joint Base Elmendorf-Richardson Fire Department in Anchorage, Alaska. He's here to discuss resiliency and leadership in the fire service. He's an assistant chief of operations, a master resiliency trainer, and an all-around great guy. Please welcome my friend, Master Sergeant Eric Barlow. Hey, how's it going, guys? Hey, thanks. Uh, my pleasure to be here, man. I appreciate you guys allowing me to come and do this. Uh, one thing I do want to emphasize that you said is an all-around good guy uh, or nice guy. Yeah, so um, I, I think we can that. all agree on that. Yeah, so no, I'm honored to be here. I'm looking forward to it, guys. So. Eric, pleasure to have you on the show, man. I'll hit our listeners with a little backstory about how we all know each other. Eric and I were stationed together here at Ramstein. Matt and I were deployed together a few years back. And you both served there at Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson. It's crazy how all over the world we keep running into each other years later sometimes. Yeah, yeah, definitely, man. It's a small world. Um, you know, I, I, I think as you progress through your career, you, you start forming that uh, that mafia that, uh, you know, I've heard Chief Thompson uh, speak about before. So and I'm, I'm glad to have you guys in the mafia. So um, we you know, what you guys are doing here, man, like I said earlier, I'm honored to be here, but what you guys are doing with the, the podcast, man, I, I think this is going to take off and I'm excited to be involved with it. Yeah, brother. We hope so. And, uh, you know, you're our first guest. So, uh, you know, congratulations yeah. on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, man. So, so brother, tell us, man, what's your background? Um, what's your relationship with resiliency? Um, you know, what makes you qualified to talk about this stuff? Yeah, man. So um, a lot of listeners out there that, that know who I am, they probably know that I have a story, right? And, um, you know, I went through a lot of tough times in life. Uh, I always said, you know, it seemed like, I, you know, I, I started out, you know, on a long line of losers almost. And uh, and I had to work my way up. And as I went through life, um, I decided, you know, ultimately my my dad was never there. My mom, she ended up passing away at a, when I was 12 years old bounced around from grandparents and ultimately I decided to join the Air Force uh, my senior year of high school and you know looking for a way out almost uh, finding trying to wanted to find a better way uh, something that I could go off into and and almost escape um, the climate that I was in and so as I as I begin my journey in the Air Force um, I, I, you know I ran into a lot of rough patches uh, you know I had a failed marriage uh, had two kids with a previous wife um, that was really a tough time in my life as an airman uh, getting divorced and and what a lot of people don't know is that you put me in a pretty bad financial uh, situation I actually filed bankruptcy whenever I was a senior airman and uh, so you know I kept going and I was I was always the guy that bottled this stuff up and and this, this pressed on. And eventually, you know, I broke down and, uh, I, I found myself in a position to where, you know, I, I had to take a look at myself and say, hey, what's going on here. And, and what I describe this as what I've come to describe this as, uh, is a resiliency awakening. Um, you know, when I was going through all this stuff as a kid and as a teenager and stuff, one thing, you know, I just felt like, Hey, that's what you did, right? Life sucks. You just deal with it. You just move on. And I never knew what resiliency was and, you know, how that played a role until I got into the Air Force. And, you know, as I got into the Air Force, um, you know, I'd, I'd say probably six, eight years in the Air Force, they really started to focus on resiliency. And that's whenever I really had that awakening and realized, hey, you know, this is this is what's helped me in life. This is what's got me to where I'm at. Um, this is what's allowed me to su- succeed and, and deal with these struggles. And it's something that I'm, I'm passionate about. Um, I know the Air Force really harps on it. And uh, and as as you, you know, we've all seen, uh, if you're a steward of the profession, is that the fire service in general has really started to focus on this. Um, they started to realize, hey, we need to create programs that really make resilient firefighters. And so what I've done is I, I reached out. I, you know, I became a master resiliency trainer. 
Um, I, I found opportunities to get involved with any anything that uh, whatever base I was at uh, was doing in regards to resiliency. And, you know, we just had the resiliency tactical pause. Um, I, I jumped on that as well. And, and when you guys reached out to me for this, man, it, it was an easy decision. Uh, you know, I, I knew within a couple hours what I wanted to do. And this was a topic I wanted to go with. And, and just because of the relationship I had with it and what it's done for me and my life and my family. So that's what's, that's what got me here, man. Resiliency. Being resilient. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing all those stories with us, brother. Um, yeah, I didn't yeah. know a lot about a, a lot of that about you. So I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Eric, we hear the term resiliency often. Can you help me better understand exactly what resiliency means and how it applies to us as firefighters? Yeah, definitely, man. So, you know, if you're if you're an airman or if you're a firefighter and you're associated with uh, Air Force Fire Protection, you probably already, you know, had resiliency shoved down your throat, right? The Air Force has done that and, and for good reason, right? We have an issue. Um you know, when I Googled resil- resiliency, the, 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 definition, the definition of resiliency, uh, what I found was uh, the official definition was the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties is what I found. Now, when I asked guys around the department, uh, what, what did they define resiliency as? Uh, what I got back was um, kind of a mix of things, but the uh, majority was an ability to bounce back. Uh, or someone who is resistant to stress, you know, and the way I like to think about resiliency is it's the vi- ability to overcome or cope and overcome. And that's the way I think about it. You know, uh, the Air Force provides us, you know, we have the four pillars of pres- uh, resiliency and that comes to mental, physical, social and spiritual. And, you know, one thing they've realized, I think, uh, over time is that, hey, you know, we have to kind of pump the brakes here and stop directing what our units will do when it comes to resiliency and allow our units an opportunity to determine how that's going to look, how that fits best for the climate that they're in. Uh, And, and, you know, that differs from different jobs, uh, different locations. And I think that's what we need to do in the fire service, Air Force Fire Protection. Um, you know, when we think about the history of resiliency, you know, this is something that the Army has been doing for a long time. You know, during the heat of the war, um, they realized that uh, they had a serious problem when it comes to suicides and depression and, and uh, the PTSD. Uh, it was causing a lot of issues uh, at home for a lot of soldiers. And this is something that the Air Force ended up taking and and morphing over into a resiliency program, um, and it, which ended up, you know, when I went to MRT to the master resiliency training, um, this is one thing I learned, uh, that, um, they were building on and that they wanted to take, and it was still a work in process. Even whenever I went to that training at, at, at Ramstein, it's come a long way since then. And I think now it's, uh, it's really ingrained in our culture. Uh, and I think most people are really starting to understand, uh, that the impact it has, uh, you know, when I talk about resiliency, um, I think of it as a toolkit, right? You want to have the right tools. You know, if you need to to uh, nail a, a, put a nail in a, a piece of board, you're not going to take a screwdriver and try to n- put that nail in that board, right? You're going to use the right tool. You need a hammer. And so you need to have that toolkit. Um, you know, oftentimes when we think about resiliency, I think it's confused with the fact that resiliency is all about, hey, coming in and, and having a positive attitude. You know, um, I, I know a guy, Ben knows him, um, to where he always preached the, you know, PMA, right? Positive mental attitude. And I highly believe in that. However, you know, we need to realize that life does suck, right? You're going to have hard days and you're not always going to be able to just come in with a good attitude. And if somebody comes in and maybe they lost a loved one or something, you can't say, hey man, don't worry, have a positive attitude, man, you'll get over it. You know, we need to allow them to cope. We need to allow them to go to the process. The way I think about it, and so, you know, if you watch boxing, um, in boxing, you know, a boxer understands that there's going to be times that he may get knocked out. Um, but ultimately, his goal is to get up before that 10th count, right? If we can get somebody that's going through a rough patch in life, somebody who's stressed out, somebody who's dealing with a lot of adversity and, and a lot of stress and, and, you know, maybe they lost a loved one, they're going through a divorce. We need to allow them to deal with that. But at the same time, we don't want them to reach that 10 count. We want to get them back into the fight around that seven or eight count, right? And that's what resiliency does for that for us. And that's what the Air Force has done with the with the resiliency program. And that's what the fire service is starting to do with a lot of initiatives that they're starting to implement. 
Hey brother, I wanted to I wanted to ask you. So you talked about yeah. tools. You don't use a screwdriver yeah. to hit or nail. You know what? Right. What are some tools that firefighters in the Air Force or in the Department of Defense or around the country? What are some tools they can use to stay resilient, to be resilient? Right. So um, you know, the Air Force is published uh, their program. You can go on resiliency.af.mil and find a lot of programs on there. I was looking at it last night, actually. And I mean, you got anything from prevention to leadership tips to to templates that somebody can take and and and, and uh, implement during a forum, whatever, uh, whatever when it, when it, uh, within their flights, right? Uh, within their work centers. Uh, additionally, there's RTAs out there, res- resiliency training uh, assistance, uh, MRTs, find an MRT, a master resiliency trainer. Additionally, I think that leaders, we as leaders and, and we as uh, firefighters that have experienced stuff like this need to make ourselves available. You know, we need to share our stories. Um, and, you know, we need to, whenever I went through a lot of the struggles that I went through, especially during my divorce, and, you know, I, I want this to sound bad, but one of the things that helped me cope was I realized that, hey, man, I wasn't the only one who had dealt with this. You know, we oftentimes we find pleasure in other people's sorrows. And whenever you start talking to people and you realize, hey, man, you know, they went through the same situation you went through um, and they were able to make it out, that really helps you cope. And that really helps you see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, additionally, you know, there's your other resources out there. You got the chaplain. You have uh, mental health. And I think um, we as a force have really – we've progressed uh, in the right direction to really breaking that stigma when it comes to reaching out and, and, and uh, taking advantage of those resources. Cool. I appreciate you expounding yeah, on man. that, man. Uh, so – you talked about being a leader and being able to facilitate and, you know, start a conversation or just be approachable. Right. Uh, I, I did the resiliency tactical pause myself here at Langley. And I think the most important detail in doing that is listening. Yeah. I got everybody in the room and you just listen to what they say. So as a, as leaders in the firehouse, leaders in the fire service, uh, you know, why is it important for us to understand resiliency and to listen? And, you know, can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, man. So, um, you know, firefighters in general, you know, you think of a firefighter or somebody with a type personality, somebody who, you know, comes into work and um, just wants to do the job. However, I, you know, I think one thing we felt to uh, remember is that many of us are walking around and we're dealing with or struggles, right? We're dealing with our own demons. Um, I know um, I was that person, you know, and with suicides the way they are, you know, I, I, I was reading a study the other day by uh, uh, IAFF, and they said that uh, 20%, they did a poll in, in 2016, and 20% of firefighters had PTSD. Now, 20%, you think about that, right? That's, you know, that's a, that's a good amount, right? However, we also have to remember that that number is probably on the low end just, just due to the stigma, right? Um, many firefighters are uh, think it makes them weak just to admit that. Uh, additionally, in, in 2019, firefighter deaths, uh, we had 113 firefighters that died due to suicide uh, compared to 58 in the line of duty. So um, combine that with 2018 study, 81%. Uh, uh, firefighters felt that admitting PTSD is a sign of weakness. And so there's, you know, that shows there's a, there's a pretty big issue um, just in the culture of, of being a firefighter. And I think that goes back, you know, you know, decades, right? Uh, this is, this is a very honorable job. And how are we supposed to help those in t- a time of need if we're, we're uh, telling everybody else that we have our own struggles? Um, this is a high stress, traumatic, uh, you know, high stress job where you're thrust into traumatic situations. You work long hours. Um, additionally, you know, what does this do? You know, this can impact somebody's personal life. And, you know, once you start, uh, th- you're stressed out at, at work all the time and then you go home and you, and you can't get that relief because, you know, now your wife's mad at you because you you missed a birthday or you, you got home from work late due to a call or what have you, man. You know, it really has, it takes a toll on people. And I think we as firefighters, we just, we, we bottle that up um, just due to the stigma. 
of, of reaching out for help. And, uh, you know, one thing I've always talked about was if you look at any study of the, the most stressful jobs that you can have, number one and two, number one is usually firefighter. Number two is usually enlisted military member. We as Air Force firefighters, we do both of those. So you can only imagine just how stressful this job can be. Um, and I think as leaders, uh, we have to find opportunities to to broaden our mindset, right, and to figure out ways to to foster a climate of openness and trust. Um, additionally, you know, um, we have to look at coaching. Where right? you know, if you played any sports, I remember playing sports coming up, and in high school, man, there's things that my coach uh, said and did that, man, like. If we as leaders did that now, man, we probably would probably get in trouble, right? So, however, uh, when I look back at that, man, that my coach was probably one of the most uh, crucial pieces of of me becoming a man, you know, of me developing and learning how to deal with uh, that. Hey, life sucks, right? Uh, life's not always easy, and we can't always baby people, you know. Um, one of the things, so I'm I'm starting a wildland class tomorrow. Uh, and one of the assignments for this class was that we had to read uh, Leadership Secrets of Attila the Hun. I don't know if you guys have read this book. Um, I never even heard about it until until it came up in this uh, in this assignment. And it's very easy to read. Um, but I, I tell you, I got to the end of it and there was a quote in there that really stuck out. And what he says is uh, Attila the Hun. So Attila the Hun is... Uh, he was the king of the Huns. And when he's talking about how to develop his chieftains uh, for the different tribes within uh, the Hun uh, you know, kingdom, one of the things that he says is appropriate stress is essential in developing chieftains. Now, appropriate stress is essential in developing tr- chieftains. And I think that that's one thing that we that goes hand in hand when it comes to resiliency and developing resilient leaders. If we baby our subordinates – Versus allowing them to, to deal with stress, allowing them to figure out solutions and allowing them to, you know, empowering them to be able to make it through those times. How are we ever going to make them resilient? We're never that's never going to happen. We have to be there to coach and mentor them. Um, additionally, you know, as we progress through the those. Uh, those different ranks and, you know, we, we broaden our experiences when it comes to resiliency. Uh, I think we as leaders owe it to our, you know, our, the future leaders to identify those who maybe stick out, those who we can um, maybe say, Hey, listen, you're going to go become a resiliency, an RTA, a resiliency uh, training assistant, or, Hey, you know what? You, you would make a hell of a, uh, an MRT um, or, Hey, you know what? There's, there, there's a committee standing up and it's, and it has to do with a resiliency. I want you to be a part of that. There should be no rank requirement for that, right? Um, if that's the you know a rookie firefighter, then hey, why not pick him, right? Know his story, and we have to engage. Uh, we have to be authentic, our, authentic ourselves, and this all goes back to sharing our story, guys. You know, if I think the best leaders I've ever met are authentic leaders, ones who share their stories, they share their past, they share their their screw ups, their mistakes, um, and it shows a hey, that. They're, they're real. They're humans, right? And that they made it through tough times and that we can too. Um, at the same time, um, you know, we have to hold everybody accountable. We have to preach ownership, right? So I know all of us are big on that. You know, you have to preach that ownership. Um, and this goes back, right? Appropriate stress is essential in developing chieftains. I think appropriate stress is essential in developing Air Force leaders within uh, the fire service. Yeah, brother, you grow outside of your comfort zone, you know, yeah. you, can't, you can't be comfortable all the time. And, you know, same thing applies to stresses in life. You you have to experience those things. That's the way to learn. That's the way yeah. to move forward. And yeah, so, yeah, definitely. And I, I picked up a little there, you know, uh, as leaders, just, just listen and be there, be there for your brothers and be there for the firefighters. I mean, that's pretty much, that's a key as a leader. But uh, so what are some actionable things, though, firefighters can do? Uh, in terms of being resilient and you know if they see issues with their brethren or even maybe their leaders or and they don't have the rank or they don't have the position to be able to talk um you know what are some actionable things 
to, that we can do or they can do. Right. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, you know, it's something that uh, it's never an easy thing to do. But uh, if you see that there's an issue with one of your fellow brothers or sisters, man, um, you know, engage with them right off the bat. You know, ask them, hey, is everything good? Uh, you know, I think that's probably the easiest or the 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 most the simplest thing you can do. It's probably one of the hardest things you could do because it's, un- it's uncomfortable, um, you know. But I think if you really, really want to uh, make an impact – if you're that person that is willing to do that, man, um, that's going to go a long way. Additionally, you know, you can reach out to those, uh, those leaders, um, that, you know, uh, are transparent, rather right? that are open, uh, that truly care. Um, you can reach out to maybe whoever is an MRT. You can reach out to chaplain, um, like we discussed earlier. Um, and you know, you can, you can just, I, I, I would tell you, man, one thing I think we've lost, is that um, sense of community, right? Uh, that tribe. And, you know, a lot of it, we, you know, I was asked the question the other day whenever it came to the four pillars of resiliency, uh, which one I thought was the most important for us right now. And it, instantly I said social. Um, I think right now we are so disconnected as a society that that's um, causing a lot of the issues that we have when it comes to suicides and PTSD and depression. Um, no longer is there that human interaction um, just due to the fact that somebody can now sit in their, in their room and, and have 300 friends on social media versus actually getting out and engaging and having that sense of community. Once I I think once somebody loses that sense of community and feels like they're no longer a part of a team um, that really gives them that, that mindset that there's, there is no hope that nobody cares for them. And so no matter, you know, the fire service, especially when it comes to air force firefighting, it's very uh, a diverse culture, right? So, uh, you know, you look on the outside uh, when it comes to firefighting. Many of those firefighters, you know, they, they come from a long line of firefighters. That's all they've ever wanted to do. Um, they go through the ranks, you know, the process. They become a recruit and, and they work their way up. And the Air Force, sometimes you're going to get firefighters that it was just handed to them, right? You know, for me. Uh, whenever I joined the Air Force, uh, firefighter was my last pick. Now, you know, I'm thankful and I'm grateful that I got this job because I can't imagine doing anything else. But there are firefighters that we have within our departments that maybe this isn't what they wanted to do. Um, and they're trying to adjust. Um, maybe they come from a different background. And we have to be open. We have to have an open mindset when it comes to that. Um, additionally, you know, when we talk about uh, those resources, you know, I mentioned earlier, the resiliency.af.mil. Um, that's an awesome opportunity or awesome resource for, for people to reach out and find opportunities. Military One Source. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but you can go on Military One Source and uh, you can actually get uh, free counseling, you know, actually sit down with the psychologist and actually discuss uh, some of the problems you're going, you're, that you're dealing with in life. And this is, uh, you know, this this puts no stain on your record, man. You know, uh, this is all uh, confidential. Nobody has to know about it. And it's, it's an awesome resource. Um, we, yep, go ahead. Oh, sorry to interrupt you, man. I, yep. so I, while you were talking, I, I got to thinking, and I yep. remember when being stationed there with you, we had the social worker yep. embedded in the squadron. Yeah. I'm wondering yeah. what your thoughts are on that and if you think it helps. I thought she was great. I don't know if there's a yep. new one now. I thought yeah. it probably did help. You know, it's, it's hard to measure something like that, but I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. Uh, test force, uh, true North is what that's called. Yeah. I know J Bar- J bear was one of the, the test bases for that. I think, uh, even Ramstein was uh, on the other side of that, as far as pulling away resources, you know, they plussed up J bear and they pulled away resources from Ramstein to see kind of compare how that was going to work out. Um, you know, J Bear is a very unique uh, assignment, as you know, or Matt, um, just due to the climate and stuff. The winters are tough, and and you know we've we've had an issue with suicides this year. Um, as far as within the unit, I definitely saw the benefits from it. Now, I think what we've got to do, the Air Force has got to do, is they've got to kind of refine on who um, they're embedding. You know, within these units, uh, I think you need the right person. Um, and the, the, the person that we had was awesome. However, she left. Um, and since then, I have not seen um, 
that impact from that program uh, just due to the fact that the, I think the people who took over just different personality um, and maybe not as engaged as she was. So, I, I, you know, it's definitely an awesome resource. I saw, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm man enough to sit here and say that uh, I took advantage of, of that resource myself. Uh, whenever she was here, I mean, I was, there was a period there to where I was pretty stressed out, uh, had a lot of stuff going on. And, you know, one day she showed up, she popped her head in the office and she asked how I was doing. And man, it was like, I had just, I was waiting on somebody just to ask me how everything was going. And I must've talked to her for an hour and a half, you know, just, just getting that off my chest. You know, having somebody just to, to vent to, man, I'll tell you, that was nice. And we all need that sometimes. And so that was an awesome resource. And, you know, we as leaders, I think, you know, I, you know, I think we can all agree uh, with this is that we as leaders, we need to have that open door policy. No shit. We need to have an open door policy that says, hey, if you want to come vent, come vent, you know. Come in my office. We'll close the door. I'll allow you that opportunity. Um, if you need to just talk and get things off your chest, hey, that's between me and you, right? Uh, and, you know, when when your subordinates start realizing that you're somebody that you, they can trust, uh, somebody that um, is going to, you know, have that open ear for them to, to just get some things off their chest, man, I, I think that goes a long way. It goes a long way. You know, Eric – you and I have spent uh, many a late night sitting in the office, yeah. as I'm sure you and Matt have, uh, talking about life, uh, you know, in, in and outside of the fire department. I think that's been some of the most healing time for me um, is sitting there talking with my crew. Uh, and that goes both ways, right? You were you were my battalion chief here at Ramstein. Um, so talking up and talking down uh, to and talking across, right, to our peers, I think that's a, a lost skill or a skill that we're is uh, slowly deteriorating amongst our crews sometimes is the ability to sit around the kitchen table and talk about that call, talk about um, people's families that, uh, Hey, I haven't seen your wife here in the, at the crew dinner for, for a month or two, uh, everything good. Come to find out maybe, maybe she, uh, she went back overseas, you know, she, she's not here anymore or something. And you might not know these things unless you sit, you sit down and you're engaged with your crews. Um, so I think, uh, you know, kind of reinvigorating that cultural kind of uniqueness about the fire department is something that, uh, is up to us as leaders to really foster that, that, um, that environment for those guys to feel safe coming in and and talking with us, but also feel safe that, Hey, I'm going to leave you alone. So you can go talk to your crew. Uh, we know we're not always on task. Ben, you bring up a good point on, Hey, I haven't seen your wife around in a while or, you know, I haven't heard about this. I haven't heard about that. Yeah. You need to have an open door policy, be approachable. That's really important. But another good tactic is to just go and talk to somebody. Hey, what do you think about the weather today? You know, I, I know that's pretty basic, but Hey, just, you never know what you can end up talking about. I, I know that from experience, I've been on both ends of that. I've, I've walked away from conversations like, why did I just tell that guy all that stuff, you know? And, but, but then I've, I've had the same thing happen to me where I said, Hey, what do you think about the weather today? Next thing you know, this guy's telling me his, his family story and his family background or issues that he may or may not have. And you walk away like, man, I didn't know that about that guy. You get some good perspective. Like now I know why he reacts the way he does in certain circumstances. This is what he's got weighing on his mind. So. Yeah. I think it's easy for us as leaders, man, to jump to conclusions real quick, right? Whenever we have an issue with somebody, um, like, hey man, that that guy's, you know, he's 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 just not cutting it or, you know, he's always a troublemaker. And oftentimes I you know, kind of what we're talking about, I you know, I've been slapped in the face a couple of times when I start talking and engaging with guys, I'm like, Holy crap, man. Um, why didn't you tell me this? And and then I start taking a real hard look at myself and I'm like, man, am I not approachable? And is there something that I'm doing that uh, that prevents these guys from thinking I'm someone they, somebody that they can come to and talk to and that they can trust with their issues? And, you know, I, I, I that's a real hard pill to swallow, man. And, uh, you know, one thing that I've done, man, is, you know, every morning, every morning I, – I, we do, we'll do the roll call and it's very informal, but I, you know, I want to sit down and see everybody every morning. I want to talk to everybody. Uh, you know, I, 
and I want to look at and read somebody's body language, determine whether or not, hey, man, aren't they just off today or what's going on? Um, because it's very easy for us as leaders, man, we're, you know, especially you, you guys both know when, uh, when you're in that leadership position on the ops, it's very easy to get occupied with uh, the admin task and, and all the hundred million things that are going on throughout the day and this neglect engaging with the guys um, that are on the cruise and on the floor and, and, and seeing how they're doing. Um, and, uh, whether that's just a quick BS session, right. To say, you know, what's going on. You just start talking about whatever. So yeah, one thing is, uh, you know, as a master resiliency trainer, um, one of the things, your, one of your priority missions is to go around and teach the FTAC classes. And I remember when I was at Ramstein and went and taught the FTAC class and um, I always try to, you know, put my own spin on those classes. It's, it's easy to take the slides and, and read the, you know, the information off the slides and, and be done with it, right? And you check that box. Um, however, I always try to put my own personal touch on it and, and be that authentic leader that we talked about earlier and share share a little bit of my story. And I got done. And whenever I got done, uh, I walked out of the classroom and one of the, the airmen from the FTEC class um ran after me and he pulled me to the side and there was a break room and we had a almost a 30 minute discussion man um to where he had been having a tough time now he was a southern boy like myself right um he had been having a tough time he had he was pulled out of uh whatever small town he lived in, in in the south and he went to the air force and now he was in germany and it was winter time he didn't know anybody there was nothing there that he was used to um and here I am, somebody that he identified with, and man, he just poured it all out there. He poured it all out there. And I think that just goes to show you, man, um, what we we're talking about earlier when it talk when we talk about this engaging and uh and talking to our airmen and to our subordinate firefighters and you know, even our peers, right? Um, and just talking to them and saying, Hey, you know, how's everything going? You'd be surprised what you hear. And and I was man, I was surprised, but I you know, that kind of that situation really opened my eyes to it, just how important what I was doing was, man, uh, just how important being resilient and how important of uh, preaching the resiliency message to the masses was um, because, you know, who, who knows what would happen. Right. Um, he could have just gone. He could have hit that 10 count man, and, and got knocked out. But I, maybe that was seven or eight for him. And I got him back into the fight. So um, I think that's what we need to do as leaders, man, is we got to really engage and, 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 and hopefully catch somebody before they hit that 10 count. You know, us as leaders, we have instant credibility uh, walking into any room for the first time just because of the stripes that are on our arm. But that can go away really quick as soon as we open our mouth. And uh, it's, it's up to us to choose how we use that credibility and how we, how we lit it progress over time. And I think, uh, someone like yourself, uh, taking the master resiliency trainer course and, uh, and then also, you know, being open and honest about your struggles, um, that, that gives you that credibility that's not inherent from your stripes. That's because you've, you've been able to prove your leadership and your openness over time. Eric, th thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, this uh, discussion's been excellent on this, uh, you know, incredibly important topic. I just want to give you the opportunity to say any kind of final thoughts. And actually, I think I remember you saying that you wanted to spend a few minutes talking about something else that's on your mind, and that's uh, the power of reading. Yeah, man. So, um, dude, I really enjoyed being here. Uh, I really think this is an important topic. Um, and one thing I, I wanted to end with is, you know, one thing I've I've learned uh, throughout my career and as I've gotten older is the power of reading. Right. When we talk about reading, um, you know, I think Chief Wright says the leader is a reader, you know, and uh, this is one of the things that has really helped me. Uh, and and one th I, I like to read a quote here. All right. So General Mattis, we all know who General Mattis is. Right. So a few months ago, I read his book, Call Sign Chaos. And there is a quote in there that when I read it, I'm like, man, this is 100 percent. I mean, this explains just how important it is. Uh, for a leader to read. Um, and he says, if you haven't read hundreds of books, you're functionally illiterate and you will be incompetent because your personal experiences alone aren't broad enough to sustain you. Dude, when I read that, 
I, I, I mean, it hit me right then and there. Um, and also made me realize, man, I needed to read more because, you know, he's pretty much saying, Hey, Eric, you need to pick it up, dude. But with that, there's a couple of books I like to throw out there for the listeners. Um, and I highly recommend, um, if you, if you want to, you know, broaden your, your, your experiences a little bit more when it comes to resiliency, a couple of awesome books out there. Uh, first one is unbroken by Lauren Hillebrand. Awesome book. Um, Granite Mountain. We talk about firefighters, um, something that's uh, related to firefighting. Granite Mountain by Brendan McDonough. You man, awesome book. Awesome book. Um, and you know, there's, there's something I used to always say out of that book. Um, I'll paraphrase here a little bit, but, um, the superintendent of that hotshot team, you know, he told uh, Eric or Brendan, who is the uh, firefighter, um, he said, you know, he said, if I make you a better firefighter, that's all good and well. But if I do not make you a better man, I fell. And and I, that goes back to, you know, talking about the diversity of, of the different firefighters that we have. You know, I always tell guys, hey, man, you know, at the end of the day, if you do two, four years in, in the Air Force, you get out. There's nothing wrong with that. That's honorably, man. Um, however, if we do not make you a better person, then we failed you, right? They should be gaining something. And that really, that book really opened my eyes to it. Additionally, uh, this goes back to the Sense of Community Tribe by Sebastian Junger. Man, awesome book. Awesome book. It talks about tribe and that sense of community um, and, and how, you know, a lot of our problems in society are due to uh, us losing that. Um Another book uh, that I read, and this is, you know, I, I didn't expect this from this book whenever I decided to read it. But after I read it, man, I was like, wow, what what an amazing book. Um, it's called Educated by Tara Westover. I don't know if you guys have read it. Amazing book, man. Uh, the struggles that she deals with um, in her life and, and how she pretty much comes from – um, a background to where women are not allowed to be educated and, and, and very, you know, just an old school way of thinking, uh, to end up becoming, you know, somebody who has a PhD. I mean, that's just, it's an amazing struggle and, and it's an awesome book. And then finally, uh, one of my all time favorites can't hurt me by David Goggins, man. If, if you haven't read this book, I highly recommend that you read it. Um, it's an awesome book. David Goggins, I mean, he's he's my hero, somebody that I look up to. Um, he puts it, you know, when we talk about that authentic leader, right, uh, somebody who's approachable, that's David Goggins, man. And he's going to tell you, he's going to give you the real, that real talk, right? And he's going to tell you uh, maybe not what you want to hear, but what you need to hear. And I know there's a lot of things I read in his book that really opened my my eyes too. And, and it's something that, uh, I, I encourage all my guys to read. So yeah, just want to leave you guys with that, man. Uh, at the end of the day, we still got a lot, a lot of work to do. I'm excited to see the journey that the, the fire service is taking in general with, um, incorporating a resiliency program, uh, in, into the fire service. Uh, I, I think we'll start seeing a lot of, a lot more on this, uh, throughout the years. And as we progress along with, the uh, with, leaders that are coming up to the ranks that are uh, a little bit more progressive and, and, you know, and have grown up in this culture. When you talked about general Mattis, I need to read his yeah. book by the way. Yeah. But there is a quote that I read and it goes along the lines of the quote that you shared. It's, it's about reading. He says, by reading, you learn through others experiences, generally a better way to do business, especially in our line of work where the consequences of incompetence are so final yep. for young men. Yep. And that yep. one, dude, that one gives me goosebumps when I read it. Yeah. And talk about being applicable to the fire service. You know, the consequence of incompetence are so final for young men and women, anybody. Uh, yeah. So I, I wanted to share that quote too. So General yeah. Mattis, man, that guy is a a treasure trove of just awesomeness and, and, and experience right. and information. And, uh, and then Goggins, of course, talk about resiliency. Mm -hmm. You know, the, yeah, if you haven't read the book, Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins, you got to get it. You have to listen to this guy's story. It's incredible. Hey, if I could ask you guys, where, where do you, uh, where do you get your, your reading material? Do you listen or do you read? Um, and if so, uh, you know, where do you get it? So, um, 
most of my reading that I do, you know, I'm, I'm kind of the modern reader, right? I, I do a lot of my reading on, on uh, like a Kindle, you know, and for me, it's just easier that way. It's very convenient. Uh, so what happens is what, what has happened, man, is, you know, the first book I ever really sat down and read was uh, Lone Survivor. Um, and man, I was hooked. I was hooked. You're talking about an intense book and it's something that I realized, hey, man, you know, there's a lot of power here. There's a lot of there's, there's a lot of that I can take from reading. And so I started doing it. And then I started choosing books and just Googling books um, that related to the topic that I was most interested in when it came to uh, leadership. And then uh, just dealing with, uh, you know, PTSD, uh, you know, adversity, things like that, man, because that's what, you know, there was times in my life um, that – man, I was really like having a hard time. Like things were starting to come back. Um, and I could start, I started to see the impact of, you know, the struggles that I had been through earlier on in my life. Um, and so I was like, you know, how, how do I find an opportunity to, to deal with this? And, you know, additionally, part of that too, was because I had that firefighter mindset to where I didn't want to reach out and get help, you know, because I was scared of the stigma. So I figured out how, how can I find a way to do this on my own? And so I started, started reading books. And then, you know, when it comes to any type of, you know, whether you're using an iPad or, or a Kindle, uh, you start reading books and then they start recommending you you know, books that are similar to that, to that book. And man, it just latched on. And from there, uh, it just took off. And that's kind of where I went to, man. But, you know, I, I think uh, I highly recommend, you know, um, branching off and, you know, not, don't, not, don't just read leadership books, you know, find out other books that are, that interest you as well, because, um, you'd be surprised. And, you know, one thing I've started reading is a lot of uh, history books, you know, books on history and stuff, because, because of reading call sign chaos, uh, because of what General Mattis said, you know, how, you know, how am I going to, you know, be able to really make, uh, sound decisions whenever I don't have anything to gauge it off of. And we as Air Force firefighters, I mean, like you're, like you were talking about, Matt, um, you know, we as Air Force firefighters, we're not ex exposed to fires all the time. We're not exposed to, you know, the incidents that our civilian brothers and sisters are. Um, so in order for me to be effective at my job, I need to become a steward of the profession and really um, educate myself on um, past incidences and uh, mishaps or, or whatever that occurred. So I can keep that in my, my memory bank. And whenever time comes for me to really engage my decision making, I got something to, to relate or to uh, bounce that off of. Yeah, there's so much value in learning vicariously yeah, through other people. Yeah. And you, you got to make up for the experience that you don't have. And you do that by reading yeah. and listening to people. Now, uh, ben, to answer your question, I know you and I have talked about this. Audio books, I've definitely dabbled. And I know you do. Mm. I, I I really like the hard copy sometimes as audio books. Man, I got to. Uh, let me scroll back two minutes because I wasn't yeah. listening to what was going on. So yeah, I, I really yeah. I picked back up the the paperbacks and stuff like that. Another thing is podcast. Just listening to podcasts, other podcasts. You, you listen to hey, read this book, read that book, or you listen yeah. to somebody that wrote the book, and they share the experiences that they wrote, you know, in the book. So uh, there's this, and you talked about history. Uh, I don't know if you guys know Dan Carlin. Dan Carlin does this podcast series. This guy's incredible with podcasts. It, it takes him like months to do an episode. This, that's how legit this guy is. He, he, yeah. uh, he is like four hour long. It's called, it's called the um, Blueprint to Armageddon. Mm. There's five episodes, I think five, six long. Ep I, I listened to it on my trip down from Alaska, man. That took me eight yeah. days. That's how long Damn. it took me to listen to this podcast. But it's about World War I. Yeah. And it, he starts out in, in, in when uh, Princip, the guy that, um, the guy that killed the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, they kicked off World War One and all that. And he yeah. just goes in detail through that how that started the war and how the everything got unsettled in Europe and how the Americans got involved in every single battle. But so you talked about history. I feel like I should mention that you don't always yeah. have to read the book or listen to the audio book. But right. there are podcasts out there with this guy. He's putting together, he's got textbooks in front of him and he's reading off all these reference materials. So anyway, I just wanted to mention that. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm from Oklahoma, so I'm, I'm not the strongest reader. 
Um, <laughs> so, you know, before a couple of years ago, I didn't, I didn't read any books. Right. Um, right. And then I got a little convicted, I think here in a, a quote yeah. similar to you, like you said, General Mattis said. So I, I started looking around and actually on the Air Force portal, I found a couple of applications called Overdrive and RB Digital that yep. are free resources. And these aren't just Air Force related books. These are leadership. These are fiction. These are history, right? right? These are business, entrepreneurship. I mean, any kind of topic you can think of is on here. Um, and not even just the B model ones, right? You, you actually get the, right. the nice kind of bestsellers. Um, right. Yeah. So in addition to that, um, I also use a commercial service that I, I pay for. And so I'm in combination between the two, I, I've got an audiobook going all the time. And Matt, you said, you know, audiobooks, you, you kind of feel the need to go back and, and research or uh, reference something. I absolutely feel the pain of that as I listen to books, but I kind of justify it like this. Um, I can read 25 books a year and soak 80% of that up, or I can read no books a year and soak none of that up. Right. Right. Um, and so I, what I do is I actually, after every audiobook I read or during, I'll take a few notes here or there and I'll kind of come away with my three kind of big points from it. And then if it's something that's really detailed as far as tactical application, I'll go back and uh, I'll look up kind of a, you know, most of these books these days have, have a PDF or something you can download that'll have you like a one page synopsis or a bullet point reference that you can look at. And so often, I'll, oftentimes I'll go on line and, and look those up. That way I can keep track of, of those tactical applications. Yeah, man. I, you know, uh, you know, Ben, that's a good point, man. I forgot about that, that resource. Uh, I actually took advantage of that myself a couple of times as well. Um, and, you know, additionally with that, you can go on there and, the, you know, Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, they have their own reading list, man, that they recommend. Um, and, you know, you can go back and look at previous, uh, uh, reading list from those positions as well that have great books on there, man. Um, you know, one thing we do, you know, we talk about, you know, Matt, you were talking about, uh, yesterday when we we're talking that you were doing the, um, uh, working with the air force, uh, fire emergency services, rookie book. And, you know, one of the things that we do in our rookie book here is man, or, uh, not our rookie book, uh, but, our our company officers transition book that we do, which mirrors the rookie book, um, just for the different position is that we, we, we provide them a, a list of, uh, books, um, that we recommend that they should read to help develop them and to become readers. You know, um, to tie this into the resiliency thing, man, you know what I talked earlier about how social, the social pillar I felt was, was our most important one that we needed to focus on right now. What we're doing here with this podcast, man, that bridges that gap. You know, I, we help bridge that gap when it comes to communication and getting that social interaction. Uh, we're saying, Hey, how does the new culture of, of firefighters and airmen, what, you know, how do they like to learn? Uh, you know, and, and everybody's got an iPhone, everybody's, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I walk into an office around base now and, and somebody's got a speaker there playing and they're listening to either music or, or, or whatever it is. Right. And now you guys have uh, created a platform for people to go in and, and listen to, to podcasts, um, that help bridge that social gap. So, uh, you know, I think, you know, that's what we have to do as leaders, man. We have to find ways to, to get the message out, uh, to those that are below us. Uh, and whatever their preferred method is, you know, and this is, this is awesome, man. Yeah. So some people don't like to read. Some people just like to listen. You know, that, yeah. I think you, you, all yeah. three of us are, are in that kind of category. Yeah. We, we like to listen to things. I mean, Ben and I talk about yeah. podcasts all the time. We talk about yeah. audiobooks all the time. So, yeah, yeah. So doing whatever we can to, to communicate to the, to the masses, you know, and uh, yeah. you, you'd mentioned the reading list, but there's another book, I know we keep going on about books, but there's just so much yeah. good out there. I don't want to miss the opportunity to to talk about a couple more. But Alone at Dawn by Dan Schilling. I don't know if you had mm. the opportunity. I see you know, I know I see you writing down. You and I used to do this when I was we right. were stationed together. We would yeah. talk back and forth about yeah, you gotta man. listen to this, you gotta read this. But Alone at yeah. Dawn, it's about um the combat controller, John Chapman. So I know that oh, you guys yeah, are familiar yeah. with John Chapman, the Medal yeah. of Honor recipient. It it goes through that whole story. Uh, just incredible book, man. That that yeah. one had me hooked. But there's other stuff in, uh, 
I don't want to name all, all of them off, but I got to mention Jocko Willink. Cause Jocko Willink, man, yeah. Man, the extreme ownership and the yes. dichotomy of leadership. So if you got to read any book by Jocko, you have to read Extreme Ownership. Yes. Just like you have to read Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins, you have to read that. But Extreme yeah. Ownership, man, that, it really was kind of revolutionary for me and the way that I think I approach every day. But Yeah, Extreme extreme Ownership, man, is one of those things that will really, man, that'll change your life after reading that book, man. That'll make you realize like, hey, you know, you know, we need to stop making excuses in life and we need to own them. You know, we don't own, own these, whatever's going on. And, and uh, I, I think if I was going to recommend, hey, what's the one thing you could do as a leader to really gain the respect of your subordinates? Own, own, own the decisions that happen, man. Own the mistakes that happen. Um, you know, you, you, when something goes wrong, you own it. When something goes right, that's all on them, man. You know, you, you give them the praise for that. Um, but yeah, I, I, definitely awesome book. Uh, you know, and to tie it back once again to resiliency, this is not just, let me read books. So I feel smarter or I have, exactly. um, I've got a bigger vocabulary now. This is a tool for the toolbox and, you know, we can help apply these, these little lessons from, from these hundreds of books that, you know, corporately we read to our, to our direct situations every day, we can apply them in, in theory, we can apply them in, in, at high levels and at the tactical level. I mean, there's, there's an infinite amount of ways that we can apply these lessons to what we do every day in the fire service here for the air force. Ben, I think you make a valid point, man. When we talk about the toolbox, right? Um, you know, we all carry around that toolbox, man. We all carry it around. And if you don't have the right tools to do the job, like we we're talking about earlier, man, you, you know, that's <laughs> things are going to go wrong, right? Um, you may get the job done, but it's not going to be done right. And so we want to make sure it's done right. And, and this is, you know, reading like how we all discuss, man, this is not to, so you can be the smartest guy in the office. You know, we all know those guys, you know, I used to know when I was an airman, I knew, you know, a guy who would go in his office, he'd read something and come out and try to stump everybody on it. Right. Especially it seemed like it was always the hazmat guys for some reason. I don't know, man. Um, but, you know, that is not what this is about, man. Uh, this is all about, hey, uh, you know, filling that toolbox with more information. And then, hey, when, when my neighbor doesn't have the right tool to do the job, I do. So let me loan it out to you, man. Let me help you out. So, um, you know, I'm very grateful for this opportunity, guys. Awesome, awesome, awesome time. And uh, I look forward to hearing all the great uh, episodes in the future that you guys are going to have. And, and uh, like I said, um, I just appreciate you guys saying I'm an all-around nice guy. I mean, that's all I ask for right there, man. Well, you couldn't have proven it more here on the podcast. So once again, we appreciate you being here on the show with us today. Hey, that'll do it for us here on this episode of the Fire Dog Podcast. You can find more content just like this regularly posted on our Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the Fire Dog Podcast. That is facebook.com forward slash the Fire D-A-W-G Podcast. Please like and subscribe. And don't forget to rate this episode wherever you listen to your podcast. This has been Perry with host Matt Wilson and our guest Eric Barlow. Until next time, stay safe. <laughs>